Thank you very much. Thank you. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this thing on? I said I feel like I'm selling ShamWows with this type of microphone up front. Anybody want to buy a ShamWow? $1,200 right now. $1,500. $2,000. So for right now, it's $99.95 just for you out here. Uh, so I, I loved that present. Wasn't that a great presentation before? Wasn't that didn't didn't uh, she did a great job with that? Dr. Cave did a great job with that. Uh, and it's very, very well aligned with what I'm going to talk about. It would be funny if I came up here and said, no, I'm going to present the counterpoint of why you do not want to work within your strengths. Okay, so you want to lead all of your people away from working within their strengths. Force them to do what you need them to do, not what they can do, right? That's what, that's what should be put out there. But I'm going to share some similar types of uh, experiences in a lot of the organizations that we work with. My name is Don Harkey, as he said. I'm a partner in People Centric Consulting Group. We work with organizations to help them to install a culture of engagement, of focus, and accountability. A culture that works better with those people that are inside. Uh, because how many of your organizations have people in them? Raise your hand if you have people in your organizations, okay? Most people do. Most organizations do. So people are kind of funny. Uh, they're finicky. They're difficult to work with sometimes. Uh, but they can also do amazing things. So we help organizations to design themselves to work better with people. So I've been asked to speak at events like this, and I've been asked what kinds of trends do we see in business. Now, we get to work with all types of businesses, from Fortune 500 companies uh, down to small businesses. And I think about all the trends, and you think about the advanced topics in HR uh, that are out there right now, all of the new technologies that are available and things. And I really go back to some really basic trends. And, and here's the one that just really gets me. And, and Sandra kind of talked about this, and I've got a little bit different statistics. I think it was the way the statistics were created, but here's what we learned. If I take eight people out of your organization, and these are eight typical people, and I just grab eight, random eight people out of your organization, here's what statistics tell me about those eight. Here's what we'll learn about those eight. These five right here are not engaged out of the eight. They're not engaged. They do their job, they go home. Sandra talked about that, right? They're, they're just, they're renters. They show up, they just do what they do. When they're driving home, they're not specifically thinking about work. They're just kind of riding along, right? If they're, as they're, as they're driving into work, they're not really thinking about it, they're just listening to the radio, doing their thing. They come in when they're asked about their opinions. They don't really necessarily give what, exactly what they're thinking, right? They just kind of roll with everything. What about these other three then? They're going to be highly engaged, right? Well, statistics show that two, up to one in four, are toxic. They're negative. They're actively disengaged. They're actually rallying troops against you, right? Now, Sandra asked this question. I'm sure you're all, you've got that person in your head again, don't you? You all know that per, you've got the people in your mind, right? Everybody in here is thinking of somebody that fits into this category, right? Right? Now, that leaves this person to be engaged all in. Really, really excited to be with the company. Thinks about the job. Drives to work thinking about how they can make their job better. Drives home thinking about the problems, the opportunities inside the organization. Ways to make it better. Right, but and they're all engaged. So what you have going on inside of your organization, if you put this into perspective here, is you have these five people who are kind of on the fence, and you're fighting this battle between the negatively engaged and the engaged people for the souls of these five. Right? You have this ongoing battle inside your organization. You have a meeting, and then what happens after the meeting? You have the after meeting, right? The after meetings all break up and there's all of the different conversations that occur afterwards and you'll see the camp circling around the engaged person saying, okay, we can do this. Let's go this direction. And you see the negative toxic people over here going, you know, that's stupid. Can you believe that guy in there? That was idiotic. We're not heading that direction. Let's see. Here's what we're really going to do to be successful, right? And there's this battle that's going on. There's a battle for the soul. Now, it's really easy for us to sit there and say, why do we hire these people? How many of you in here hire people? Every, a lot of people in here, right? You've hired people. Has anybody in here ever hired somebody and said, wow, you are toxic. You are negatively engaged, but you are so skilled, I would love to welcome you into our organization. Anybody in here ever done that before? No. When, you, when they were hired, were they toxic? I like it. I'm getting both. No, yes, no. Confused, right? Something happened to them while they were at work that made them toxic. Something's happened to them. Now, some people have such a broken career and so many bad things have happened to them that they go in with this natural suspicion of the organization that they work for, that you, you must not have my best interests in mind. And they come in pre-toxic. But most people, when they show up for a job on the first day, they're excited about their job. Am I right? I've got a new job. Let's see what I can do. This is kind of cool. What's going to happen? Right? And then they learn, and they fall into one of these categories. Right? Now, if you don't believe me, I want you to take a really honest moment for yourself. Have you ever been toxic in a job before? 
And be honest with yourself. I'm seeing most people are nodding their heads. If you're saying no right now, you're stuck in your current job, like that job you had in high school, you weren't toxic at the pizza place you worked at. You didn't think you knew how to run it better, right? The telemarketing job that you had in high school that I had, right? I used to sell blue blocker sunglasses on the phone, right? And people would call in. We used to sell, uh, they also they sold all kinds of stuff. We sold magazines, we sold blue blocker sunglasses, Ronco food dehydrators, and I was the guy on the phone. And when you called in, and, and this was way, way, way back, so the computers were fairly primitive back then. We just had a little, it was green on the black screen, and you didn't have a lot of options on it. And one of the things we sold were, uh, it was a dent, re like if you had a scratch in your car, you could buy this product and rub it on it, and it would make the scratch go away on your car. And people would call in with that, and they would call, and they'd have a manufacturer's, not like they'd call and say, okay, I've got a, I drive a 1995 Honda Accord. It gives you an idea about what year this was, by the way. Uh, 95 Honda Accord, and it's a light blue, and here's the manufacturing color number, and I've got the color palette and all this information. My screen says blue. Is it red, or is it blue, or is it black, or is it yellow? Or, and that was all the choices I had. There was no matching colors. It was roughly like you got light blue, dark blue. All I have is blue. So I'm going to give you blue. So I had somebody called in, and they said, you know, I, I've got this manufacturer number, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, all I, I've got blue. I'll match up blue. Do you want to buy blue? And they said, well, yeah. And then she asked me, she said, so do you think this is going to work? And I said, no. No, there's no way this can work. It's, a, it's probably not a good investment of time for you uh, or money. Uh, continued to work there for a couple more days, by the way, just after that. But I was definitely a toxic employer. We all have been in that point where we're misaligned with what's happening around us, right? We become toxic. It's something that's happening internally. And I look at this, these numbers, and it kind of ticks me off. It kind of ticks me off because we're not hardwired to be like this. We're not supposed to be like this. You're going to spend 40, 50% of your life at work to be disengaged, to not use your brain, not use your natural talents, or not use your natural strengths. This upsets me. This has a, this, I take this personally. What's the impact of this when you think about seven out of eight people are not fully engaged in what they do? If you think about that stat, seven out of eight people are not fully engaged at work. That's messed up. That's messed up, right? You have internal unemployment. Have you ever thought of it like that? This means you have internal unemployment. Forget underemployment and unemployment in the market. You have it inside your own organization right now. You have more people than you probably need because you have people in there that are not all in. Right? And you've heard the stories. I heard the story of a company the other day that had 50 employees, and then they had a big turnaround. They lost a major customer, and they had to cut it down to 30 employees. And they said they were suddenly able to get more done with the 30 than they used to get done with the 50. What's going on there? A lot of you are nodding your heads going, you know, I think I've seen that before in my career, right? What's going on there? It's, you've got internal unemployment going on inside your company because of this lack of engagement. You have these toxic employees, right? And unfortunately, they don't wear the masks to work, right? You have to know who they are. And they have an incredibly negative impact on your business. And we're going to talk about more about how to handle these employees in a, in a little bit here. You have poor communication. You show up to the meetings, you give your team a very clear direction. They break up, and then they have the after meetings, and they set up a different direction. And now what's going to happen, right? What are we going to do? This guy's really paying attention to this meeting, isn't he? Right? And then that's when people come to us and said, well, our communication's poor, but they can't put their finger on that. Like, what does that mean? Maybe we need a newsletter. You know, I, I had one manager ask me, they said, do I need to speak louder or slower? <laughs> try, try both. I don't know. It's probably not going to work, right? It means that you're not as successful as you could be as an organization. When only, seven out of, when only one out of eight of your people are highly engaged at work. It means you don't always know what's going on. Now, this is terrifying to a lot of managers, and when we talk about this, a lot of people don't like this, but I want to share a story. A Fortune 500 company that I was involved with had a CEO who decided to take a tour of all the plants going around. And it takes, it takes a long time because they've got plants all over the world, and the CEO was making the tour and got to the Midwest and was starting to hit some of the Missouri facilities and was getting ready, to, was scheduled to hit ours. So the plant manager watching this happen what do you think the plant manager do, would do? What would be smart for the plant manager to do? 
tell everybody they're coming, right? They don't want it to be a surprise visit. The plant manager doesn't want to be surprised. They're the last person that wants to be surprised. Our plant manager decided to call the other plant managers who had already had the tour and said, what's he looking for? When he comes in, what things is he picking up on? And one of the things that he found out that he was picking up on was high inventory. The CEO knew that if you have a lot of stuff in your warehouse, it's stuff that you've already made, it's cash, right? Those of you in manufacturing understand this. If your warehouse is full of stuff that you've spent the money to make but haven't sold yet, that's bad, right? So he was walking through, not really having any knowledge of how big the facility was or the warehouse was to the facility. It just, if he saw a full warehouse, he was blaming the plant managers and yelling at him for it. So... Our plant manager decided, well, we're going to fix this because we didn't have enough warehouse space in our facility. So he said, well, I'm going to fix this. So we're going to take, uh, go ahead and go out to our warehouses. And he rented trailers, put them out on the back in, in a position in the plant where you couldn't see. That was not obvious. And move the inventory from the warehouses inside out to the trailers to make it look like it was empty. Yeah, this included some goods that were refrigerated. It cost the company tens of thousands of dollars, by the way, to do this, of time and labor and renting the trailers and keeping them powered because some of them were refrigerated. It risked the quality of some of the goods. So that when the CEO, the head of the company, who should know everything that's going on, walks through, they would see a semi-empty warehouse and go, nice job. Nice job. That's a spectacular story, isn't it? It's happening inside your organization. There are things like that happening every day that you don't know about that you, you would be shocked at. Your employees are saying, if you're going to measure me, show me how you're going to measure me, and I'm going to show you how I measure up. And if that means fooling you, if I can't really impact the success of the organization, I'm going to impact what you think I'm doing. And they're fooling you. That's what the impact of all this is. And it's bad. So what's causing this epidemic, right? That's the question that I have to ask. This is bad. This is really bad. We need to get more people involved in business, right? We need to win over those seven people, right? So what's causing this? There was a great study by the Saratoga Institute that they interviewed. They had 19,700 employee interviews they did. And these are people that have left companies and people that were inside companies. And they took all of this data and they, re they rallied around seven reasons for disengagement, seven root causes of disengagement. Why are you disengaged? Well, the job is not what was expected. Tell me, have you ever heard that before? Somebody who was upset or that's not what I expected to get into. I know healthcare deals with that a lot because it seems like I'm going to be helping people all day and then you have to go clean a bed or something. You're going, that's not what I signed up for, right? The job doesn't match the employee. We talked about the strengths, right? You put me in a job as a bookkeeper and I can do a lot of math, but I cannot, I, that, the detail on that just would bog me down. It would struggle. I don't fit it. I'm not hardwired for it. I don't like doing it right? Too little coaching or feedback, right? I'm, I'm doing my job every day, but I don't know if I'm being successful or not. I don't know if I'm winning or not. Too few growth and advancement opportunities. We were talking about this over here during uh, one of the sessions, one of the breakout sessions. Do I have an opportunity to impact what happens here at work every day? And if people don't feel that, if they don't have that, they're disengaged, right? And it might be that you disengage them, not that they've disengaged you. Workers feel devalued or unrecognized. They feel like sometimes they're made to feel like they're stupid. Right? You get frustrated with people, and managers and bosses are notorious for this. I get frustrated. Like, why won't you people just listen? You're so stupid. Right? Stress from life, the work-life imbalance. Your life, the ex expectations are too high at work. Okay? A lack of trust in senior leaders. Those idiots don't know what they're doing. The big challenge. I saw a presentation on the White House, what it's like to work on the White House, and somebody said, you go through three phases when you go work at the White House. Phase number one is, I can't believe I'm here. I hope nobody discovers that I shouldn't be here. I am not that smart to work here. I can't believe that I'm here. I hope that nobody discovers. Phase two is, you know what? I can do this. I can do this. And then they said, phase three is, I cannot believe these idiots are running this country. Right? And that's kind of a phase that we all kind of go through at work, right? And sometimes you see it. And if you, if you don't have faith in their senior leaders, that causes disengagement. Well, you look at these seven different causes and you try to break these down. What's really the root cause of this? What really is happening here? I think it's these three things. 
Number one, I think we have ineffective managers. People who manage other people are ineffective at managing and leading them, fundamentally. This is at epidemic levels. We see this with clients that we work with. They're not trained, they're not equipped. Okay. Number two, we see ineffective talent management systems. How many of you have a talent management system? Not very many hands go up. How many of you don't know what a talent management system is? A lot more hands go up. Okay. And a lot of companies that do have talent management systems have ineffective talent management systems. And I'm gonna talk about what a talent management system is and why it's important. And then the last thing is inattention to the culture of the company. The failure to acknowledge how important culture is. So I want to talk about these three areas because we've got to win this battle. Okay? You got into this job, I'm assuming for a similar reason why I got into the job that I'm at now, is so that you can see people be successful in what they do every day. So that you see people when they drive home and they've got an idea to improve the place, that they can come back the next day and they can do something about that idea. And the company's more successful when that happens. You know, Sandra shared those Q12 questions and laid those out. If you look at the patterns caused by the Q12 questions that make employees engaged at work, and you apply those over to organizations, the organizations are more successful, the people are more successful. Those two things are very aligned, very, very aligned together. So ineffective managers, what do I say, what do I mean when I see ineffective managers? Here's what happens. Here's somebody making french fries. Anybody ever had a job making french fries? Yeah, you have? Is she doing a good job making the french fries? I've never, I've never done it. No? What do you not like? What, what's she doing wrong? She's dumping everything. Oh, yeah, she's not dipping. You know what? Okay, you're the first. I've done this presentation like 20 times now, and you're the first person to point that out to me. You're absolutely right. The basket is like, it's made to go like that, not to dump the whole fries in the fryer, right? That's kind of weird that she's doing it that way. I hadn't even thought about that, right? So, and now I notice she's wearing the gloves. I notice she's also going like this as she's pouring it through that, right? So when a typical fast food place hires somebody, don't they train them to do this? Oh, yeah, right? You train the heck out of them. Like, they're going to make French fries, right? What happens if the French fries are bad in an organization, right? So they train the heck out of the person to make the French fries. And when that employee receives that training, and let's say you're awesome at making the French fries, what happens if you're awesome at making French fries? You You go to burgers, right? You get promoted to the grill, right? Or you get to the counter, right? You start moving up in the organization, right? Pretty soon you're managing and leading people, right? Because you're awesome at what you do. So suddenly you're standing in front of a group like this, training them, and look how engaged they all are, by the way. This was not one of those Google photos of, hey, show me disengaged people. This was just, show me training. And this was a person training. And this was actually at a website where they were saying, look it, we do extensive training for our employees, so you should sign up here. And I'm looking at the body language of the people at this training going, they really look engaged and excited to be there. Right? But it doesn't make sense. What kind of training did the manager get after they became a manager? You are going to lead people now. My very first job, I used to be, when you get into business consulting and motivational speaking, you, I, I went through the normal career path. I started off as a chemical engineer. True story. Started off at Archer Daniels Midland. Was hired the first day. They said, Don, welcome to your new job. You're in charge of the mill. You now have 15 operators who have been there for 30 to 40 years, our Teamster operators, and we never found the body of the last engineer we brought in. Good luck. And I had to walk into that control room and literally go like, hi, I'm Don. What does the mill do? I don't know what we do here, right? We put our managers and supervisors in these positions where they're supposed to lead and motivate people without any kind of training at all. Right? This employee gets extensive training. We want to make sure that she doesn't just dump the fries into the fryer. We want to make sure she puts it in there the right way because we don't want her to get burned and we're really concerned about the quality of the French fries, right? But then suddenly when they get promoted to management position, somehow leading people is not that important anymore. We don't put the same emphasis on it. Okay? And they're expected to lead and train employees. So what does this cause? This causes a spiral effect. If they're not good at it, if they don't do it the right way, they don't engage employees the right way. They don't know how to motivate them. They don't know how to hold them accountable. They don't know how to keep them focused. Okay? It's a supervisor trap. Mary's good at what she does. Mary gets promoted. Mary thinks her job is to get others to do what she used to do. Right? And then when others don't do it the same way, Mary gets frustrated and takes it out on her employees. And does it sound like Mary's a good person to work for? 
And it's not Mary's fault. It is, but it isn't, right? We didn't train Mary to do what she did. If you put me in the fries or without any training, I'd probably dump the fries into the fryer too and then take the basket and try to scoop them all out, right? That's the next step. Makes a lot of sense to keep it in the fryer. But you tell me to do that, I'm going, oh, that makes sense. Now I know how to do that. We need to be training our managers, people. On a real basic level, we want to do all these big uh, fancy tools for HR and analysis and all this stuff. Train your managers how to effectively lead and motivate people. Because bad managers, here's what they do on a daily basis. They're the ones that are on the front line working with the employees. Here's what they do on a daily basis. They accidentally, they put employees in a position where they can't succeed. And I put this that they accidentally do this because no manager I've ever met says, I'm going to make sure I put my people in a position where they can't succeed. But it happens all the time. They reduce the effective intelligence of their people by telling them what to do. I tell the story all the time of my son. He's 13 years old, really, really smart. Okay, he aced the map test in math. Got 100% on it. Really, really just incredibly smart, okay? At dinner, we're gonna have pizza, and I'm thinking, well, you gotta eat something with a vegetable on it, and, and pizza sauce is not a vegetable, according to my wife. I think it is, she does not, okay? So I tell my son, go to the, go to the fridge and pull out some carrots. And my incredibly gifted son goes to the fridge, opens up the door and goes, uh, where are the carrots? And I'm thinking, we do not have a walk-in refrigerator. It's right there in front of you. I mean, they're orange, right? I mean, it's not hard to find carrots in the refrigerator. You might have to dig around a little bit, but I mean, there's a drawer that's marked vegetables, actually, that's clear, that has the carrots leaning up against them. But he doesn't even, he doesn't open the drawer. He doesn't look around. He doesn't do anything. He's disengaged, right? He's not thinking. He's not applying his brain. And the reason that he's done that is because over the years for dinner, we've said, oh, it's okay, honey. I'll go get the carrots for you. And we do that to our employees, right? Bad managers do that accidentally. That's okay. Let me t you go do go do this, and then come back, and I'll tell you what to do next. You just your brain shuts off and goes okay, right? And you do it. It effectively limits the intelligence of our people. They create an environment where employees disengage. Let's all have a meeting, and let's talk about the future of the company where I'm going to speak for 80 percent of the time. Are you engaged in that? No, right? Poor, the bad managers accidentally run boring meetings. How many of you don't like meetings? A lot of people are raising their hand right now, right? If you don't like, some of you are not raising your hand because you've seen me speak before and you know what I'm about to say. What am I about to say? If you don't like meetings, I was expecting a big pause when I come back. Okay. You're not doing them right. If you don't like meetings, you're not doing them right. Meetings are energizing. They're exciting. They should be very focused. You're bringing people together within strengths with different perspectives to come up with a common solution to something. That's energizing. That's exciting. If you have a boring meeting, it's broken. Something's wrong with it. You should do it differently. And bad managers don't know how to have meetings, so they bring their people into a room, and they tell them all the stuff that they're doing, and then they have everybody go around the room and tell them that I'm doing my job. Right? My name is Don. I'm doing my job this week. Thanks, Don. And then they go around, and everybody's on their phones, checking their phones until it gets to them, because it's horribly interesting to the person who's talking, but for everybody else, it's terrible, right? Bad managers accidentally, they create a clear lack of direction. They create a lack of clear direction for their team, and it creates what we call thrashing, right? The team is responding to this. Now the team's responding to this, and now the team's responding to this, and what are they worried about now? Uh oh the CEO's coming. We've got to take all the inventory out of the, Okay, now we're going to do this, and now we're going to focus on this. And the team doesn't know what's happening from day to day, right? They get a lack of, they have a clear lack of, a lack of clear direction, okay? Bad managers foster a culture of blame. Who did that? Who did that? Please stand up and I will make sure you get in trouble, but not as bad in trouble if I find out later who it really was, right? They, they don't know how to hold people accountable, how to foster a culture of accountability. They discourage their people and make them feel stuck. Don't, you don't have to solve that problem. That's not your job. That's outside of your pay grade. Let me fix that for you, right? And they allow toxic employees to thrive. And everybody in here who's thinking about a toxic employee right now at work, if you're not actively addressing that right now, you are allowing your toxic employee to thrive. Okay. Nobody strives to be a bad manager. If the difference between a great manager and a bad manager might just be they need some training. Okay. We do offer some training on this. We're starting a new management course in January. 
really, really excited about. We're actually going to talk some more about that, and maybe we'll give some opportunities for people here to send somebody to that. So some of the root, next root cause of engagement, ineffective talent management. Some of you don't know what talent management is, so we're going to go through some of the basic components of talent management. The idea of talent management is you have talent inside of your organization that's not being fully utilized. You need to systematically, you have a, need to have a systematic approach to utilizing the talent of your people. Okay, the engineer is still in there. It needs to be systematized. And it's not a one-time training thing. It's not a one-time initiative. It's a systematized way of making sure you're getting the most out of your people. And here's some of the components of a talent management system. Okay, first of all, hiring and onboarding. Hiring. Hire slow, fire fast. How many of you know have heard that before? How many of you practice it regularly? Oh, we need, we need warm bodies in the room. We're really shorthanded, so I'll go ahead and hire this person who's not exactly the best fit for that because I'm getting a lot of pressure to get somebody in the place, right? We've all made that mistake at some point, I'm guessing. I know I have, right? Nobody that works for my team now, they're all great. Right? And then fire fast. If you think about what happens with people, uh, our job as supervisors are not really to help them be successful. Does that sound funny? Our job is not to help them to succeed or fail. Our job is to help them do it faster. If you're going to be really successful, I want you to be, get as successful as fast as possible. If you're going to fail, I want you to fail as quickly as possible so we can move on and limit how bad this mistake was. All right? If you think about it that way. I like Some of you are looking at this skeptically. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Establish a standard hiring process. I, I know a room full of HR people have a standard hiring process, right? That's pretty basic. How you handle people. Initial screening. Use personality testing. How many of you utilize personality testing? really powerful tool. Like the technology exists to look at how a person is hardwired. You can measure the strengths of that person. You can look at their personality traits. You can understand if they're basically going to be a good fit for a job or not be a good fit for a job. You can understand that before you bring them into your office. Hugely powerful. How you do interviews. Look at the cultural fit. How many of you think about cultural fit when hiring somebody? That's a huge thing. That means you have to understand your culture, right? That's a big part of it. And then references and research. You have to do all of these things. A lot of times we skip references. Oh, that's easy. It looks good. I don't want to find out anything bad. Right? And, and, and I put references and I put research in there because the research part is kind of important too because the references are usually good, right? References are usually pretty good. But it is good to do a little bit of research. So best practices. You ever hired somebody, you bring them in, and you have that oh no moment? Right? You know what I'm talking about? That moment that you're like, oh my gosh, we've made a mistake. Right? When you go to do something. I had it, we hired an intern uh, a few years ago, and a uh, really nice guy, really, really nice, uh, was kind of a son of a friend, and like, he wants, he's passionate about what you do, and he wants to get exposed to it, and he'd come in and it worked pretty cheap, and we're like, yeah, okay, for the summer, why not? And so we thought, what we'll have him do is we're going to just have him come in, and he'll do some writing, like, he'll do social media. Right? He's a millennial, so we'll put him on social media. I know that's a stereotype, but so we'll have him write some stuff for us. And he can write reports and edit stuff for us. And so we, said, we, we brought him in, and kind of to walk, he shadowed us for a while. And then we had a, I went to write a proposal and said, okay, here, you can write this proposal. Here's a template. Write this proposal. He wrote the proposal, gave it back to me, and I looked at it and went, oh, no. He could not write his way out of a box. I mean, it was, the writing was horrible, 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 horrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible writing. And I'm thinking to myself, I should never tell anybody this story. Because we help other companies do this, and I just made the mistake. I knew I wanted him to write, and I never had him write before we hired him. Never made him write something before we hired him, right? Isn't that obvious now? So I'm glad I never tell the story in public, right? Because it'd be horribly embarrassing if it really got out that it happened to us too, but it happens to everybody. You should be able to look for that oh no moment that you think you're going to have with somebody and try to create it before you hire them. Create that through the interview process. Okay, when, I was, uh, when I was an engineer, we were hired another engineer, and we put him in a position where we gave him a project in the interview and said, okay, here's the project. And we gave him a real project and said, now, we'll walk around with you. We'll give you the resources you need, but you, your, your first day at work, we're going to give you a project. So today's your first day. Here's the project start going around, how would you approach this? And we walked around and we watched him try to work with people and how we talked to the maintenance folks and how he did all this. And the first day, we knew that that's what we would see. That would be the oh no moment. And he did a great job with it. 
So we were really confident when we hired him, and he turned out to be a rock star. You can create that moment before you hire them. It's okay to build some tension into the interview. Some of you, if you're really nice, I tend to be nice. I have a strong harmony sense. I like harmony. I like the group all getting along. So when I have a conversation with somebody in an interview, I like it to be meaningful. I like to, I like to, emo, uh, I like to evangelize our cause. This is what we're doing, and you could be a part of it, and you could be the best you that there ever was. And they walk out of that interview just going, yeah, let's do this. And we walk away, and then people say, well, are they going to be a good candidate for the job? And I go, I really have no idea. They seem really excited about it. That's not really your goal in an interview, right? Sometimes you need to create some tension on that. We were interviewing a candidate for a bookkeeper, and we looked at their personality assessment, and there were a couple of parts that were off on the personality assessment, but they had been very successful in their career as a bookkeeper. And in the interview, we said, according to your personality assessment, you're not a very good bookkeeper. Talk to us about that. But you've done it, so something's off. Tell me, tell me what's off. And that was a hugely important conversation to have, right? It was really insightful. It's okay to create a little bit of tension in the interview. You want to see how they're going to respond to it. There's going to be tension at work, right? Personality testing can give you tremendous insights, and we've already talked a little bit about that. But you can, you can try before you buy. And I would go into this in a more extent, except the first hour and a half you kind of saw some of that. Not that Strengths Finders is really a personality test per se, but it's a similar type thing. And then onboarding. How many of you onboard? How many of you have a process for onboarding employees? When you, an employee starts off, studies show that your opportunity to get them in line happens, the best opportunity happens in the first hour. The second best opportunity happens in the first uh, day. And the third opportunity happens in the first week. Right? Think about the jobs you've had. How long did it take you to figure out the culture and what was really going on there? It takes almost no time, right? You get it really, really fast. Okay. We had a client that hired a salary position from out of town. The, this, this gentleman moved his whole family to work. It was a high-paid salary position, highly technical, showed up for the first day at work, and their supervisor had taken a two-week vacation. And they had no idea he was coming. So he came up front, and he went to talk to the, the receptionist up front who said, well, I don't know what to do with you. Just have a seat. I'll try to make some phone calls. He had shown up a little bit early because he was excited about the job. So he sat in the, the front area for about an hour, hour and a half. Just waiting until finally somebody came in. They said, well, I don't know what to do with you. Another supervisor stepped in said, I'll just, I'll put you at this desk. You know what? Here's our website. Maybe just look at that for a little while. See what you can do. I guess I got a meeting this afternoon. I guess you could come with me. Right? That person lasted a month. It lasted a month. You're setting expectations from people. What if you started a job and you started a job and let's say you're going to come work for me and you came in and I said on your very first day of work and I said, look, our culture at People Centric is absolutely about impact. It, we have to impact the clients. That's the number one thing. And this is why we've hired you. We brought you in because you have these skill sets. And we were looking for somebody to fit on our team. So then this is what's going to help us to become a better team. And you are a hugely important part of that. You feel good, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Where's Randall? She's coming to work for me now. Sorry. This is going to happen. Right? Why, if you have that conversation with somebody, they're going to go, they're going to be all in. Okay, well, that's right, I'm important. Now I see why I'm here. Right? It's such a great opportunity. Don't throw away that onboarding piece. Don't just say, well, I don't know. Sit down and you go through the employee manual and then sign out in the back and then go onto our website and look for this and here's your email and get that set up. Have a very deliberate process for it. It's called imprinting, by the way. All right, another, another talent management basic, management training. What should you train your management or managers on? We talk about it around these three areas, and this is what it means to be people-centric, by the way, and this is in our logo right here. It's engagement, focus, and accountability. You want employees who practice engagement, focus, accountability. You want managers who focus engagement, employee accountability. You want systems that have engagement, focus, and accountability. It's all part of your culture. This is what makes you successful in working with people. So we talk about engagement. You should train your managers on how people are motivated. How are people fundamentally motivated? And if you don't know how people are fundamentally motivated, you should find out because it's fascinating. And the science is very well known. It turns out it's not this. Right? I can get you to do something short term by doing this, but I can't have you do anything long term. Give me your phone. Give me your phone. All right. That was just an example. I just wanted to see if she'd give me the phone. Right? But it works. So what happens if I set down my gun now on the table and I start to walk away? What are you going to do? 
You can take the gun. Go ahead, take the gun. It's not loaded. This is a demonstration. <laughs> okay. So now you're pointing it at me. Now what do you want me to do? Get your phone back. Okay. Here's that. Can I have the gun back? No. Great. So now I'm, and now can I just go? You really? You're not going to call the police on me? A lot of people shoot me in the back of the leg and then call the police and then take my phone I, like, and take the gun and the phone, right? That's what these external forms of motivation do. They work for a little bit, but as soon as you put them down, they don't work anymore. And managers think that they have to figure out ways, oh, well, I'm going to pay you a little bit extra, right? Y your high performance on the year depends on whether you get that extra 2% at the end of the year. Right? I'm going to motivate you that way. People aren't motivated that way. People are motivated by working within what their strengths are. Right? You spent the first hour and a half today learning that. If you're working within the things you're good at doing, it turns out you're more motivated when you're doing it. People are more motivated when they have some choice over what they do, when they have an impact on a day-to-day basis. And people are more motivated whenever they know what the purpose of what they do is. They know why they do what they do on a daily basis. That's what motivates people. Managers need to understand that. Okay. They need to understand about how to delegate stuff. How many of you struggle delegating things? It's probably because you're good at your job, right? I love how you own that. Like, I am, right? Ask her to raise her hand and say, you are. Go ahead. Yeah, did you see that? <laughs> you owned it, right? Do you work together? It seemed to be. I was like, I hope so. If you didn't see, because you just really judged her a lot. I just wanted to say that. Yeah. It's really, uh, delegating is hard. I struggle with delegating because you're good at what you do and you want it done the right way and so you do everything and it's really hard to let other people do it because you're responsible for it. But as a manager, your primary job is to manage and help other people be successful, not for you to be successful, right? I had a company the other day that I met with and they said, well, we don't really have time to spend time in management training because we have working managers. And I said, you need to change your culture from having working managers to have managers who also work. Right? Because if I can get everybody in this room to follow me towards a clear purpose, let you work within your strengths, know what you're really good at doing, and we all have a clear purpose together and we're communicating really well, man, I can get anything done. We can solve any problem. Is that right? And that's what your managers do. Okay? And then developing employees. Where are they going with their career? Are they having conversations with their people? Where do you want to go with this? Let me give you some opportunities. We were talking over here about that doesn't necessarily mean opportunities to move up the ladder. We tend to think like that because sometimes we are up higher on the ladder. Sometimes that means just being able to impact the, your job on a day-to-day -day basis. Serving on a cross-functional team with another department to be able to improve a process that they have to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are opportunities to expand, right? What things can you learn? Right, when I was interviewed, when I was, uh, went through performance appraisal when I worked at 3M, they asked me, what position, what's the highest position you'd like to attain in the company? And I said, CEO. And they said, <laughs> Don, you're not going to be CEO, okay? What position, what's really, realistically, what's the highest position you'd like to attain? Right? And I went, CEO. And I can remember at the end of the conversation, because I was already becoming toxic, by the way, and 3M's a great company. I don't want to put, I'm not putting 3M into the bus, but I, I, I've worked for a couple different companies, and 3M is a great company to work for, great people, but I was becoming toxic and misaligned. At the end of it, I said, they said, they said, so at the end of this, what's the highest position you'd like to attain? I said, CEO. I was being stubborn. They said, okay, if you're just on putting that down, I said, yeah, but maybe you don't understand me. It's either going to be CEO of this company or another company. Maybe it's not here. Not a great thing to say when they're about ready to give you a raise or not, but. So focus, we need to teach our managers how to focus. How do they focus their team? How do they not thrash around? They need to understand team dynamics, right? Teams are going in different perspectives. You have different stories in your minds on what's happening. You have a meeting and everybody comes away agreeing and then everybody goes off and they do different things. Leaders need to understand how that works. What happens when that happens? How do I prevent that from happening? How do I keep everybody on the same page? Leaders need to understand how to run great meetings. We need to take meetings back. I love meetings. Meetings are so energizing. There's nothing better than getting people together to talk about something that's really, really important and then taking action on it because they're focused on what they want to accomplish. Okay? You need to focus on prioritizing. Not all of these. Look at all these different things that we're doing. How many of your businesses are choking on opportunities right now? We've got all these different things. What are we going to do? We can't focus on all these things. Prioritizing those things. 
right? And we think about strategic planning. When you think about an organization, and we do this with a lot of, a lot of companies, strategic planning should not just happen from the top. It should happen all the way down to the organization. The top people set a top key objectives, and then that really rains down to other departments, and they set their own objectives so that everybody knows how they fit into the whole. It's very focused, it's very accountable, and it engages the employees. Accountability, the A word. How many of your organizations struggle with accountability? Yeah, that's a lot of organizations struggle with this. And it happens on the front line. It happens on the day-to-day -day conversations. It happens when the person does the paint. I loved that picture of the paint on the roadside that went around the log because the person didn't go, click, you know. Let's stop the truck for a second and move the log out of the way. We'll just go ahead and zip around it, right? It, what happens is that s several people saw that person do that, and nobody said anything, right? And we see what, what leaders need to learn is how to s establish a culture of accountability. Now, what's the difference between a culture of blame and a culture of accountability? A culture of blame focuses on you mess that up. You are wrong. You are to blame. You are the problem. A culture of accountability focuses on what happened. You did this and it led to this. What are we going to do differently next time? You see the difference there? It's a big difference and leaders need to know that. Leaders need to know how to deal with toxic employees. I'm still gonna get back to that. I wanna talk more about toxic employees. And then leaders need to know how to deal with conflict. A lot of people are naturally hardwired to not wanna deal with conflict. I don't want to have that difficult conversation. If I can avoid it, I'm going to avoid it altogether. But you have to be able to deal with conflict. You have to have those difficult conversations. Okay. Next thing, employee development is absolutely critical for talent management. Coaching and mentoring. You have to understand when people come in, how do they understand the company culture? What is that culture like? How do they fit with it? Okay. They need to have a career path. Where am I going? What things do I need to learn? And I think about breaking this up in terms of soft skills and hard skills. And I hate the term soft skills, by the way, because soft skills, there's nothing soft about soft skills. There's, there's nothing more I can do for your company than help your people with their soft skills. That's the most impactful thing you can do because that's what causes, that's, that, that was the glue that glues everything together. That was in the quote earlier that we saw today. And then the hard skills, what things do you need to learn? Should be, managers should be having these conversations on a regular basis with employees. Not on an annual basis, on a regular basis with employees. Okay, roles and responsibilities. This is a big one that we see in companies and it's kind of surprising, right? If you're gonna trust your team to do the right things, they need to know what those right things are. And a lot of times we'll go to companies and we'll hear the manager say, our team is not doing this. And then we go to the team and say, so team, what is your job? And they say, well, I don't know. They don't really have clear roles and responsibilities. When you think about an organizational chart, and there's been all kinds of experiments about these matrix charts. You know, let's, let's make the team matrix thing, and let's do, there's the top-down structure, and there's the matrix, and let's flip the organizational chart upside down, and everybody's got the dotted line supervisors and things like that. And you look at the org chart, and it doesn't give you any insight. It's like the spaghetti diagram of stuff. And it's like, well, who do you work for? Well, I report to this person, but I also have a responsibility to this person, but then I'm in charge of this, and they're in charge of me for this. That leads to confusion and clarity. So believe it or not, what I'm going to tell you right now is everybody should know exactly who they report to. One person. Everyone should report to one person. Right? In my company, we have two owners. We're equal partners. And we have been very careful to define our roles internally so everybody doesn't have two bosses. Right? It's tricky to do, but it's very, really, really important. Don't get cute with the dotted line. There's people have role responsibilities, right? I'm responsible for this role. I am responsible for this presentation right now. I can take it any direction I want to, right? We don't have to sh reflect that on an organizational chart. What we do need to reflect is the person that I work for who's going to judge my performance at the end of the day and then help me to perform better tomorrow. That needs to be really, really clear. Okay? Is this type of org chart... Does that give you any insight? Right? No. It doesn't. Everyone needs to know exactly who they work for. It's helpful for us, and sometimes when you think about designing it, we'll help companies to redesign how the roles and responsibilities work. And as you grow, you really need to think about redesigning it. Because what happens is you start off where everybody does a little of everything, and then you just keep adding people to it. 
and it becomes really inefficient. Usually you see profitability start to, to, to drop as you can't see where that efficiency is going. Right? It, the more people you have, the more opportunity you have to have people work specifically within their areas of strengths and really define what those roles are. So we've added some language and we've created, we've distinguished what a difference between a role and a job is. A role is a set of responsibilities. A job is a set of roles that a person has. So a responsibility or a role might be bookkeeping. Okay? But my office, office manager might be in charge of bookkeeping, but that's just part of her job. Right? And the reason that you think about it like that is because it allows us to be flexible about some, what some of those roles are. So if my office manager is not great at bookkeeping but has all these other strengths, I can start to customize and move some pieces around, help them to be strong within what they're good at doing. Right? Making sure that all of my roles are covered. Okay? It has to come from both sides. We like to think about creating role mission statements. What is your job? Everybody should be able to answer that question uh, within those roles within about one sentence. My job is to do this on a big picture. If you don't have that kind of clarity, strive for it, because it will help out. Uh, and each department does need to be carefully designed. I'm still an engineer, and I think about your organization as a machine. And it needs to be carefully designed has to have people in the right places. Don't just keep throwing bodies at something that's not working. Take a step back and say, what does this department really do? What roles need to exist for it? And then worry about plugging people into those roles. Okay, performance management and feedback. This is one of my favorite topics. How many of you just love to do performance appraisals? I'm not seeing any hands roll go up. Right? People don't like these things. How many of you do performance appraisals? Most of the hands go up. So something's wrong, <laughs> right? If we don't like doing something, but we all do it, why are we doing it, right? Eat your broccoli, eat your asparagus, because it's really good for you. Well, if it's good for you, if I brought your employees in the room right now and I said, hey, how many of you love to do your performance appraisals? Are they going to raise their hand? No, right? They're going to go, oh, I hate those things. So what you have are managers who are sitting down with employees on an annual basis, and they're having to go through this motions of filling out this form, of this paperwork, so that you can decide whether you're going to give a 2%, 3%, 4%, or 5% raise to that employee next year. Right? When every study that I've ever read indicates that that type of performance management does not work. So let me give you an alternative. Sometimes changing the name is big. And we started a system we call quarterly check-ins versus performance appraisals. Performance appraisals are, let's meet annually. We're going to judge your performance. And by the way, I have a bag of money behind me, so just talk openly right now. But I've got a bag of money behind me, so if you say the right things, you'll get some more. But I want you to be honest. So what weaknesses do you think you have? I don't have any weaknesses that I'm aware of. Right? Where do you want to go in your career? Well, I'm incredibly happy with where I'm at, unless you need me somewhere else. Right? And you have these meaningless conversations. What if that changed to, let's remove the pile of money. Let's forget the pile of money. What if we, changed, tra we trained our managers to have a discussion with our employees once a month, and they sat down and said, where do you want to go with your career? Hey, and you know what? When I've watched you work, here's the things I'd love to see you do more of, and here's the things I'd love to see you do less of. And by the way, what would you like to see me do more of and less of? Am I giving you enough recognition? Are you getting feedback? Do you have a clear role? What things would you like to learn? Last quarter, we talked about you picking up these extra skill sets. How's that going? We talked about these challenges you were facing with your team last quarter. What's happened since then? Right? And we call them check-ins. When we've installed this process, it's funny. The first observation I have is people like to do them. They like to do these. The and guess who likes to do them? The employees like to do them. The check-in, it's a place where they can actually give their feedback back to the boss. It's a conversation on how we can work better together. We had a company that put this in, and then they got really busy launching a new product, and they didn't do their check-ins on time. And the employees said, when's my check-in? When's my check-in? When's my check-in? I want my check-in. Right? You never hear that with performance appraisals, unless there's a raise tied to it, and they're looking for the raise, right? So different type of a process. We think about high performers and low performers on a team. What if we just had the philosophy that everybody on your team is a high performer? And when somebody on your team is not a high performer, we're working towards fixing that? What if we changed our philosophy on that? There's that old bell curve idea, and well, everybody's an average employee, and everybody's high rating, low rating. 
When we've seen people rate employees, here's a funny thing, is you can get a really high rating. I talked to an employee who got the highest possible rating after performance review, and I went and talked to that employee. I said, congratulations, you've worked really hard this year, you got the highest possible rating, what do you think? And his response was like, you know what? I didn't do anything different this year than I did last year. They just saw it. They finally spotted it, right? And you go to talk to somebody who got a low appraisal and said, so how do you feel? They go, man, I don't think they see what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And if my boss was just doing this and they start to become toxic, they could see what I did and they just like this other person better and that person, they think they're working hard, but they just, they just kiss the manager's butt, right? This is not a healthy dynamic. Okay? If everybody on your team was just considered to be high performer and you told your managers, everybody on our team is going to be high performer, and if you're not a high performer, we're going to work to you towards being a high performer or we're going to start promo discussing promoting you outside of our team, right? Be quick to act when performance suffers, okay? Now, everybody has bad days. Everybody has bad days, okay? When I was driving up here this morning, I looked in my, I looked in my bag that I carry with me, and I have no business cards. So I'm going to speak to a group of 150 people, and I have no business cards. So all of you who mobbed me afterwards are like, I'd love to talk to you some more. Can I have your business card? I'm going to have to look at you and go, no, I didn't bring any. Right? That's a mistake. That happens, right? If that happens to me regularly, that's a performance issue. You should correct that immediately. Right? But we should talk about that, and I should be clear that that's a mistake. We need to give feedback constantly to our people, regularly. Make sure that they know that they're not a high performer. We need to get them there. That needs to be set. We, we changed our employee manual at PeopleCentric. We have a, this employee manual that's kind of soft, kind of fluffy from a PeopleCentric view because it's all about working within your strengths and finding your passions with working within, with clarity and purpose and things like that. And when we were hiring people or we were interviewing people, people come in and say, oh, I want to become part of that. That's really what I want to be. And we didn't like the flavor of the interviews and people wanting to join our team and things. So we said we needed to put an edge on it. And I, and I credit Diana, who's our business manager, one of our executives in our company. And she, she put this line in there and she said, adequate performance will earn a severance check. And she put that in one of the first couple lines that you read inside of our, for our employee manual. And it's designed to be a punch in the gut. And we talk about it now when we interview people, when people come to work for us. And we'll say, I know that we look like a really attractive place to work for, but we expect incredibly high performance from everybody that works here. Our team deserves nothing less from each other. That's the culture that we've established. Anything less than absolute great performance is just not tolerated. And it won't work. And I think it's been really healthy for our culture. The watershed conversation. How do you deal with a toxic employee in performance management? What if you went to an employee and you said, okay, I'm going to use you as my example because you're making fun of me earlier. So if I said, okay, Mary's great, on, Mary's great technically at what she does, but she's really, really negative with her employees, with other people on the team. She just tends to always be down on the people. She talks about how bad the company is, right? Doesn't she do this all the time? Just work with me now in this example, right? Okay, yes, it's awful, right? right? But Mary's got a lot of knowledge. She's been here for a long time. So I have that, I've got this, this issue of like, well, do I let you go? Because you're kind of good at what you do, but you really got a bad attitude on it. How do I deal with this? What if you had a watershed conversation? A watershed conversation works like this. Oh, you know what a watershed is, right? It's the point where water is going to go either this way or it's going to go this way, right? There's a watershed. I'm going to force the water to go this way or to go this way so it doesn't stay on the roof. I'm going to force it one way or the other. So what if we had this conversation? Mary, you've been with us a long time. Your technical knowledge is unsurpassed. I really appreciate all that that you've done. But honestly, I've been watching you and how you interact with the team. Uh, after meetings, you're regularly having conversations with other people. You seem to be leading other people away from the company. And that needs to stop. I am 100% in with working with you. If, you're will if you see what I'm talking about and you're willing to explore that and willing to work with us, I will put all of my resources and I will spend a lot of time with you to help you to get past that because I think you formed a really, really bad habit. But if you don't see what I'm talking about or if you just think that it's justified to be able to do that, that's okay, but it's time for us to, to, to part ways. Okay? It's time to promote you to your next opportunity outside of our organization. I wouldn't say that to the person directly. I just say that to you tongue in cheek, right? Right? Now, what have I done in that conversation? And we've seen lots of clients have that conversation. I'm going to force it to go one way. What happens if she turns around and she becomes she says, "Okay, you know what? I didn't realize I came off like that." I'm really going to explore it. 
I gave her ownership of her actions because the truth was she always had the ownership of her actions, right? It's only when she perceives that she doesn't that she doesn't own them, right? She can't change. I can't change her. She has to change her, right? So if she does that and she starts to explore that, she can really make a huge change. And we've gotten letters from people, from employees of companies that we hadn't even met from people who've had watershed discussions saying, I don't know what you said to my manager, but they have just completely turned around. Okay. Now, some people will look at it and say, I am so far gone against this company. This, you know what? This is just another example of you not treating me fair. You're not, you don't care about, she, she, she misses, she just comes in late to work and, and, and she doesn't do her job all the time. And, and, and she, she, Becky's cool, but everybody else is really messed up, right? I don't know what you're talking about. And then we just say, well, you know what? Maybe it's time for us to part ways. And you say, you know, maybe it is. Did we win? You won. If they improve, you won. If they don't improve, you won. Because you move them on. Because the only place they can really do damage as a toxic employee is to hang out in the middle. Is to sit on the roof. Because the roof's going to start leaking. And the water's going to come through. And it's going to start to mold. And the mold's going to spread. And you're going to get the black lung. Or whatever you get from mold. Right? It's going to become out of front. Toxic employees, trust me, and if, I could, if you walk away with one thing out of this thing, other than training your managers, your toxic employees, you're making two mistakes with them. You are overestimating their value to your company, and you are underestimating the negative impact they're having. I promise you that. Remember the story about the warehouse? You don't know all the bad things they're doing. You are only seeing a tiny, tiny portion of it. That person that you have in your head right now, I challenge you to deal with that in the next 30 days. I don't want them hanging out in your company anymore. I want them either moving actively towards improving their performance, their alignment, or I want them moving towards working for somebody else. And believe me, one of the coolest things, and if you don't think this sounds very people-centric, one of the coolest experiences I've had is I have seen employees from one company, one client that we've had who are very toxic, have that conversation, leave that company, and go work for another client of ours and be a rock star. Right? Because face it, sometimes it does. I'm not telling you if the company's right. Sometimes you're just out of alignment, right? It doesn't matter whether the company's right or wrong. If it's out of alignment, it's out of alignment, and it's okay. Don't get angry about it. Just agree to part ways. You ever seen anybody thank you? Ever anybody thank you for firing them? It does happen, right? Thank you for releasing me from this because I have been so stressed out. So glad to get to finally move on. The okay, last thing is leadership. Leadership succession. Do you know who's going to take over the company? Do you know who's ready for that next management role? Have you created a pipeline of talent inside of your organization? 15% of businesses in North America and Asia felt that they had enough qualified successors in their pipeline for key leadership positions. That means 85% go, who's our next leader going to be? I don't know. I don't know where they're going to come from. And I think part of the reason that they don't know is because they don't have these, this talent management system in place. If your managers are having conversations regularly of where is your career going, where's your career going, what are you developing, how can we expand the horizons, what can we do next, what can we do better, you're going to start to see some people just really step out and go, you know what, I can do this, I can do that. Okay, great, let me, give you, let, me, let me throw you in some water that's a little bit over your head and see if you can swim to the surface. Let me give you some expanding, some horizon expanding experiences, right, before I even promote you. All right, let's see what you can do. And oftentimes we see our clients Take people who are in a position down here and watch them just, just explode, and suddenly they're in a position up here. Right? We work with a bank that had in a year, in one year, I had an employee that was a teller supervisor and ended the year as a vice president. In one year, because we allowed that person, we engaged them, and we saw what skill sets they had, and they just blossomed. Okay? It's part of this talent management system. You have a plan for owner succession. If you're the owner of your company, ask yourself that question. If you're not the owner of your company, go back and ask your owner, do you have a plan for owner succession? And if they say no, you should. I I didn't need to say that last part. So this is talent management basics. This is the second piece that you need to have installed to be able to really to fight disengagement. This is, the, this is the battleground, right? This is what's happening. This is, these are all systematizable things you can do, things you can install. Okay? Last thing, root causes of disengagement, inattention to culture. 
Culture is absolutely critical. Culture is so, so, so important. Why is culture so important? Okay? We think about what culture really is. Culture is this witchcraft thing, right? It's this current that drives a company, right? It's this thing that happens out there. But you can kind of break it down. You can start to understand it. You can actually define culture. You can think about stories that happen inside of your company. Okay? When I work for ADM, you get a good idea of the culture if I tell this story. We had a boss at ADM. His name was Ray. He was my first boss, supervisor. Most intimidating man I have ever met in my life. Okay? Ray was kind of a big guy, and he was super, super smart. Really actually a great manager looking back at it, but I was so intimidated. I wanted to perform so well for him because I just wanted to be right because he, just, he just knew the answers to things, and he, just, he was big, kind of a burly guy, and just intimidated the heck out of me. To give you an idea of the culture of the place, this is a story that people told, told me when I first worked there. This was in Iowa, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. If you, have anybody ever been to Cedar Rapids? If you smelled the plant, I'm sorry. That was my fault. Uh, you can smell it when you walk in or when you drive into town. But they had a tornado uh, warning. And whenever they have a tornado warning in this huge production facility, it's the second largest corn plant in the world, what they would do is they would put spotters on the corners of the plant, and they would stand up there with a the radio, and it was on a radio channel that everybody could hear, and they, would, they were looking for storms, looking for tornadoes. Because you can't shut down the operation. It's not like everybody just shut everything down and go to the basement. The thing has to keep running. Okay? So until the tornado is imminent, they're not going to shut down anything. So they put the spotters out there, and the spotters are out there on the corners, and they see a tornado come down out of the clouds and land in the cornfield outside of the plant. And it's heading right towards the plant. It's moving that way. And they get on the radio, and they say, there's a tornado heading towards the plant. And one of the pipe fitters who worked there told me the story. He says, so we're all getting ready. To, we're all huddling into the shelter, and I'm making sure all the guys come in there. And he says, and here goes Ray. And he walks right by the shelter. And he's not saying anything. And he's walking towards the fence where the tornado is. He says, and you can see this tornado. It's out in the field. And you can see, like, debris starting to come up from the tornado. And he says, and Ray walks over to the fence line all the way out there. And he looks out there in the fence. It's a tornado. And he goes like this. As sure as I'm standing here, that tornado went back up into the clouds. And everybody who worked there heard that story multiple times. And it became kind of a legend. But doesn't that give you insights into the culture there? Scared the tornado. Ray stared down the tornado and scared it up into the clouds. And you know what? I work for Ray. I believe that story. <laughs> that happened. Ray stood there and he held that tornado accountable and said, you are not going to take this plant down. He just stared there. He just looked at it. Another quick race story to tell you, you get more ideas into culture and how palatable this is and how important this is. I, we had a night shift that I was working, and we had a really bad night on the night shift, just terrible night, trying to keep up with production. Machinery wasn't working. We had all kinds of problems that were going on. And we were sitting there, and it was in the morning, and Ray was coming in, and I was getting ready to leave, and I was sitting talking to him, and I was giving him my report. And Ray was just very serious about what was going on, and I was really serious. And we had a pretty good relationship at that point, but he was still, it was just a very, very crucial conversation, difficult kind of, you know, it didn't work out, we're going to try to do this. And Ray's all on a line. And Ray just sits back in his chair and he goes, oh, like that. Ray was kind of big. And we had button shirts. And his buttons go, Doo -doo. it was the funniest thing I have ever seen in my life. And he locked eyes with me and looked at me like this. <laughs> like, laugh, do it laugh right now. And I, have, I, you know, you make your face muscles just go completely limp, right? I'm just like, right? That was the culture there. It gives you insights. It gives you insights into what happens there. So when somebody comes in as an engineer, do you think, i give you an idea. So when I start, do you think I had a desk? Do you think I spent a lot of time in an office in that culture? No, I spent all my time out in the field, right? How do you think I dressed for work? Do you think I wore a tie when I went to work? No, we didn't wear ties. We wore these uniforms. We had, we had tools and stuff that hung from our belt, right? I've got these old pairs of boots that are still hanging in my garage as kind of a reminder, and they're all torn up. Right? I've got this old hard hat that's got all these scratches and nicks on it and stuff, right? And, and we wore those with, with pride, right? They were battle wounds. When a new engineer started, we always said, boy, look at how shiny their hard hat is, right? You made fun of them for it. Right? I caught a couple of them going outside and like banging them up against the wall. Right? I don't want to just rub and corn syrup on it and stuff. I want to make this thing sticky and nasty like everybody else's because I want to be part of this culture. Culture is hugely important. These heroes that emerge, like Ray, right? 
the rituals that happen, the company picnics that you have, whatever those things are that you do on a regular basis that your organization do, those are rituals. Those are things that happen. Those are part of your culture. The history, where did it come from, right? ADM had a 72-year-old vice president who came in wearing a suit, an Armani suit, visited us from Decatur, and one of the fiber dryers went down, and fiber starts hitting the ground, and what they, all they can do is shovel it up and put it into a different dryer. And they bring bobcats out, and everybody kind of circles around, otherwise that stuff really piles up. And this guy in an Armani suit, 72 years old, rips off that Armani jacket, throws it into the corn, and starts shoveling. That was 72 years old. Not only did he start shoveling, he shoveled faster than any of the operators there. And he made a point to let everybody know that he was doing it that way. And it made everybody else go, no, I can do this faster. I can do this faster, right? That's culture. Culture is hugely important. You need to be able to understand how important culture is within your organization. It comes from everyone. You don't get to dictate what it is. But you can look at the best parts of it. And you can encourage the best parts of it to hang around. Right? So you think about it, a culture is always a yin-yang. So like at ADM, the culture of working really hard, everybody being all in, that's a very good culture to have for a production facility, right? The, the yang of that culture is sometimes things weren't as safe as they could be. Sometimes we, took, we cut corners because you wanted to get production rolling, right? There's a yin and yang of that. So you have to acknowledge that as management. You have to say, what's the good part of our culture? What's the bad part of our culture? And you have to utilize that. When you bring somebody in from the outside, you have to recognize that if they come in with that wrong culture, that it's not going to work. We hired an intern at ADM while I was there. And, and Ray came to me one day with the, with the intern and said, this is, a, this is, I don't remember what her name was. We'll call her Sandy. This is Sandy, our intern. Uh, she's been working here for a little while. I'm assigning her to your department for two days. And if she doesn't work out at the end of two days, I've already told her that she's fired. So then Ray says, come with me for a second. So we stepped out of the office, leaving Sandy there, who was obviously very upset already. And we stepped out, and he says, Don, I don't know what to do with her. I'm just giving her to you. If you can make, get anything out of her in two days, then that's great. If you can't, forget it, because I'm, I'm done with her. We've had her in every other department. She's failed everywhere else she's been. You're the last, last straw. So we went in, and I've, I talked to her and found out a little bit more about her. She's out of school. She's studying to be a chemical engineer. And... She came into the job expecting it to be she was going to sit down and design stuff. She expected her to be, have the calculator and sit down up in the control with the drafting table and lay out all of the stuff and do, be able to design stuff. And her job was very, very different from that, right? And so she was very, very upset at what was happening with the job. So we were in the middle of work. That break was over, so we went off to work. And what we were doing is we were changing out... Uh, dust socks in a dust collector, and they're these big, they're about seven feet tall, and you have to reach over, and you take these bolts off, and there's like 3,000 of them, and you do them one by one, and you take these bolts off, and you take them out, and you have several people working inside of it. It's about 110 degrees inside this thing, and you're handing them out. You're getting sticky. You come away from that glaze, like a glazed donut, because you're sweating, and the sugar just sticks to you, and it's a nasty, hot job, and you're pulling the stuff out, and she's up there working with us, and I notice she's standing by the pile, and she's just kind of like, like every once in a while, she kind of kicks something back onto the pile. She didn't want to get dirty, right? She's kind of kicking stuff onto the pile and watching stuff. So I came over and I said, hey, Sandy, I need you to come over here. Do this other job for me. She says, what's that? I said, get in the dust collector and start taking this thing apart. And she slowed down the job significantly. And all the other operators got mad at me because we slowed it down. And then she went in there and she was working and she was doing this. And she did that for about an hour and a half or so before the next break came up. Next break comes up. She comes out of there and she's just glazed. She's dirty. She's upset. She was mad before. Ha! <laughs> She was hot. She was hot. So we go downstairs. We go into the break room. She's sitting in there. She's drinking her coffee, and she's just steaming. And she's thinking about walking. I can see it. She's thinking about walking. And I said, you know why I put you in the dust collector? She says, to teach me a lesson. I said, what lesson do you think I was trying to teach you? I don't know. I guess I did out of work. I said, No. I said, what did you come here for? She says, I came here so that I could learn how to design dust collectors, not take socks off of dust collectors. I said, well, that's interesting. So if you were to design a dust collector that did exactly the same job that we were just in, what things would you do differently based on what you just did? She said, well, I would probably put those bolts not seven feet up in the air where we had to reach up to do this, and it was really uncomfortable. I'd probably do it from the bottom instead of from the top. I think that would work better. And there really wasn't enough room around the outside as we all worked in there. We could have got more people in there if it was just a little bit bigger. She started coming up with these ideas. And I said, so within our culture, we're very much value production and actual work. And didn't we just make you a better engineer? 
I want you to think about that. She sat there and drank her coffee for a little while. And then when break was over, she was the first one upstairs. Crawled into that dust collector, kept working, worked her butt off. Ray came to me and said, what did you say to her? Right? Culture is incredibly important. You have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge that it's there. People may not fit with the culture. People need to understand why that culture exists, why that culture is there. Okay? Another example. Organization has a culture of avoiding conflict. Anybody have that culture? The nice culture? We're in a team. Our team gets along, right? We don't have bad, bad discussions. The elephant's standing there, but we're not going to talk about the elephant, right? And the culture prevents critical conversations from occurring that might create improvements. It's the organization standing there. They all know things that they can improve. They've all got a great idea. They all know what those things are, and they're not talking about it because they don't want to upset anybody, right? That's the moment when culture absolutely trumps strategy because your strategy is designed to handle these improvements. Your strategy is to engage those improvements, but your culture is preventing you from doing it. Okay? You have to acknowledge this culture. You have to talk about it. I worked with a group last night of a, a, a civic organization. It was a group of Kiwanis clubs. Anybody here a Kiwanis club member? Off chance. Yeah? Good. And work with a group of Kiwanis clubs, and they were talking about how the culture in Kiwanis clubs are very hands-on, get out there, work with the kids, right? Get work on the improvement projects. And they're also, the culture is very, our club is doing this, what's your club? That's our club's project, not your club's project. And they talked about how that's limiting what they can do for these kids. And how they want to embrace the hands-on culture of, it's a, it's a friendly organization, we work together. But they want to start to reject the culture of, this doesn't, of, we're going to keep to ourselves and not work together, not to collaborate. They started having that conversation. They started realizing that. And I think they're going to do some really amazing things next. They're starting to collaborate. They've actually got a plan for these five clubs around the Springfield area to meet again and discuss the, uh, a common calendar for the next year so that they can work together on events instead of all doing their own different events. It's really exciting to watch that. But they have to acknowledge that culture first. Okay. Ineffective managers, ineffective talent management, Inattention to culture. This is what's causing this problem. Okay? We've been in the information age for years. You've got all this information on your pads and all the, on your paper, on your uh, phones, right? How many of you have these things? Right? I gave you yours back, right? Okay, I just want to worry about that. Yeah, I get this phone call later. Who is this? I don't know you. Yeah. We've all got these things. We've got all this information, and we think this is going to revolutionize our companies, right? This has revolutionized how our companies work, but we are exiting this age. We're still going to hold on to these things, but companies have figured out that in order to be more successful, they need, we've exited the information age, and now we're entering into the inf inspiration age. Okay, because the organizations that realize that if they systematize how they inspire and, man and handle the talent inside their organization, if they figure out how they can let their people do what they're great at doing every single day, if they can inspire communication, and they don't have working managers but managers who lead people, they're not taskmasters, they're not transactional, they're transformational. Right? Those companies are more successful. There's nothing better I can do for your organization that will impact the bottom line more than coming into your organization and working with your people to install a culture of engagement, of focus, of accountability. That is the biggest opportunity in every organization. And how do I know that? Because seven out of eight of your people are not checked in. And if we can wake some of them up, you're going to multiply your workforce without hiring an extra person. Right? We call it people-centric. What I want to encourage you to do is this is a movement for us. Okay, We're going to put this out there. This is a movement for us. If you see something that you consider as engagement, focus, accountability, and you see those stories happen inside your organization, I want you to use the hashtag PeopleCentric if you use Twitter or Facebook. If you don't know what I'm talking about here, stick with me for a second. Right? Hashtag PeopleCentric. We want people to start sharing those stories. And we're starting to see a few of those come in from people. Hey, I saw this happen. Hey, my team didn't do this. I, as a manager, kept telling my team to do this idea. Instead, I engaged them to do it, and then they ran with it because it was their idea. Look what they drove. I engaged them, and I was successful with it, people-centric. Right? Tell these stories of engagement, focus, accountability, because we need to recognize that this is how we can be more successful. I am tired of it being acceptable for seven out of eight people at work to not be engaged at what they do. As a chemical engineer, I used to read old books on project management, and there used to be an acceptable death rate on projects. If you spend a million dollars in capital, you're probably going to have one death per million dollars in capital spent. 
Our culture, our society decided that was not acceptable anymore, and that's not what happens anymore. We as a culture need to stop as managers and say, managers lead and inspire people. We need to focus on that. We need to train on that. We need to invest on that. We have accountants. We have HR professionals that help us. We need companies that help us with our leadership, companies that help us with our communication, companies that help us with our talent management system. This is what's important, okay? Some quick examples. Biz Forwards, how many of you from Springfield have got to read this, or how, how many of you seen this magazine yet? This magazine just came out. Got to work with 417 Magazine. Absolute great example of engagement-focused accountability to get a great project done. 417 Magazine is one of the top regional magazines in the country for a city the size of Springfield, the 417 area. They decided to launch a business publication. They decided to do this about a year and a half ago. But all of their people are incredibly busy. So Gary Whitaker, publisher of 417, could have gone to his people and said, guess what? We're going to launch a business magazine. Everybody's in. Let's do it. And their people would go, oh, my gosh, we've got all this other work to do. What are we going to do? Instead, what he did was he practiced engagement. He went to his team and said, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? Do you think this is an opportunity? And he engaged them in the discussion. And they came back and said, you know what? This might be an opportunity. And then he went out to potential customers, potential advertisers, and he said, do you think this is an opportunity? And they came back and said, yes, I do think this is an opportunity. And then they got focused, and they said, what do we want this thing to be? And they decided what it was going to be and what it was not going to be. Right? And then they held each other accountable. They set a very clear schedule for how they were going to launch this and who was going to be involved. And his team absolutely put in 120% time to be able to get this thing launched and done. And they were incredibly successful with it. They launched with over 1,000 subscribers, and they sold all of their advertising for the first year before the first issue even came out. Is that buy-in? That's buy-in, not only from your employees, that's buy-in from your customers, too. Okay. Another example, how many of you heard of Gig Salad? Right? Several of you. If you're looking for talent online, right, that's where you go. You go to Gig Salad. If you're looking for a professional speaker, you can go to Gig Salad and you can look up profiles of people. If you're looking for a clown who also juggles and fire breathes, you can go on Gig Salad and you can maybe find somebody. Maybe not in Springfield specifically, but somewhere nationally, somebody probably does that. And this website. And this is a company that's actually based in Springfield, Missouri. Okay? This company, as they decided to grow, they, started, they were getting some momentum. They started to engage their employees and say, what can we do better? And they talked about the experience on the website. They needed the clarity of what it was that they did because they had talent booking and they did the website and they did all this other stuff. They decided to focus on it. And Mark Steiner, the CEO of Gig Salad, was recently quoted in an article and he said, the most important thing we did was we focused on what we did best. And we got my team engaged with it. And they started working on rebranding themselves and how the website experience worked. And they reached out and they started touring with talent and saying, what can we do to make your lives better and how can we make your talent more successful? And they did it. And they've grown like crazy. They tripled their staff. They've done more than that to their revenue and their profit. Incredibly successful. Okay. Vision Clinic. Group of, eye, uh, of optometry practices. Right? Got very, very focused on let's engage our people. Let's engage our customers. What's the experience like when you come through one of our clinics? Right? Already very successful. Started focusing on this. Their people started uh, discovering all this talent that they had. People who were running different departments, different areas, started really showing up. We started making really clear roles. They didn't have good, clear roles. They had all the responsibilities divided up between the different docs that work there. We gave them, instead of having them, everybody work for five people, we, had, we gave them a really clear organizational chart. They designed it. They started exploding. They're looking at what they could do next. Real successful. People are doing this, and it's working. Okay? It's time to take back the day. It's time for you to not just go to work and just have whatever happens to you happen to you. It's time for us to be deliberate. right? It's time for us to take back our business. It's time for us to win over those employees that we don't have yet. Okay? It's time for us to tap that wasted talent. You already have the talent inside of your company that you need to solve any problem that you have. Believe me, I'm a consultant. You know how that works is you come to me with your problems and I go to your employees and tell you how to fix them, and they tell me how they're going to fix your problems. I'd rather teach you how to talk to them. Right? It's time to take back our success. Okay? It's time to be people-centric. Are you with me? It's time to be more people-centric. Okay? Since I didn't bring my business card, here's how you can get in touch with me. Questions? Questions? All right. Seeing none. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.